test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a clerk from a moving company and a woman who wants to relocate to the United States. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, ma'am, and welcome to Australia's Moving Experience. How can I help you? Well, I, I hope you can help me. I'm so up in the air right now. I... Just calm down now. Let me guess. You're moving and it has you a little confused. That's it, exactly. You see, I'm relocating to the United States next month, and I'm having a hard time getting organised. Here, fill out your name and address, and let me ask you a few questions. Oh, what should I call you? My name is Jane, Jane Bond. OK, Jane, first of all, what's your work phone number? In case I have any questions about things. My work phone is 9463 5550. But please try not to call me too often there. My boss hates personal calls. So does mine, ma'am. So does mine. And what address should we ship your things to? My new company is letting me stay temporarily at 509 Clark House. That's C-L-A-R-K, uh, 1137 University Drive in Seattle. Seattle? Beautiful city, I hear. Mountains right beside the ocean, almost. Cooler than Australia, too. OK, and when should we come pack your things? Uh, I guess that would be on Monday, March 11th. Do you want any help with an after-packing clean-up? We do that for a small additional charge. Yes, that would be helpful. I promised the landlord I'd give her the keys back by 5pm on Thursday the 14th. Great. We'll just schedule the clean-up for that day. That way, the place will smell clean and there'll be no dust. Well, you do think of everything. Oh, how much is this going to cost? Here is a list of our basic prices. Oh dear, this seems rather expensive. Yes ma'am, but you're paying for the best. We're careful and we're fast. Like we say, the only thing we break are speed records getting you moved. Well, maybe that's so. Oh, I nearly forgot to tell you, I don't want my furniture shipped with me. I won't be looking for an apartment till after I arrive in America. Would it be possible to put my furniture in storage here for a month, then have it sent along later? Of course, we do that all the time. A couple of other things. Here at A Moving Experience, we try to pack your things logically. We don't just throw stuff in boxes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do you have any special requests? You know, things you want packed in some special place so you know where to find them. Like what? Oh, I don't know. Things like dishes, maybe. Not to be rude, but you look like a lady who likes to eat. Ah, yes, I need my dishes and things where I can find them quickly. Great. We'll put those dishes and cutlery in what we call the emergency pack. Can you think of anything else? Mmm, I do have an antique tea kettle my great-grandmother gave my mother. I wouldn't want to lose that. So I guess you'd better put that in storage with the furniture. Grandma's tea kettle with the furniture. Got it. Say, how about things like your alarm clock? You don't want to miss your plane on the big day, right? Well, you certainly think of everything. Yes, that's right. I'll also need my alarm clock where I can find it. Fine, we'll put that in your personal package. 
And of course, we'll give you a list of where we pack everything. So all you'll have to do on Thursday the 14th is grab your luggage on your way out the door. Um, I couldn't help noticing the new CD player you're carrying. Is that a Samsung? Why, yes it is. One of their best. Cost me nearly a hundred dollars it did. Do you want to take special care of it? I mean, it's brand new. Take care of it, but nothing special. You can just put it in storage with the furniture. That looks like everything we need here. I guess you're all set. That was certainly quick. Thank you, young man. This has been a most moving experience. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a talk by a security worker from Sydney Airport who is introducing the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi everyone and welcome to Sydney Airport. Today I'll be giving you the inside information on the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service here. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of why such heavy security regulations are necessary by educating you on how we operate and why we do the things we do. We're not here to try to persuade you to fly through Sydney Airport, though we hope you'll find your experience relatively stress-free and comfortable. First things first, our personnel. Can anyone guess how many people work at Sydney Airport? We have 200 alone working in Terminal 2. So can you guess how many in the whole airport? I heard someone say 360. That's getting closer. What? Did someone say 2,000? That's way too high. Sydney Airport actually employs 440 people. A lot, right? And about half of those employees work in security-related matters. Moving on to our not-so-human employees, let's come and see our favourite pooch, Milton. Milton is our best drug-sniffing dog on the force. He's friendly to most people. You can even come pet him at the end of our tour. Burnouts, beware though. He'll find everything. Notice that even though there are so many of us around him, Milton stays quite calm. This is the precise reason he was chosen for the job. Dogs that are chosen are not predisposed to sniff out different narcotics. That's something we teach them already. So here's a part of the airport most people never notice, the cargo transport terminal. This is where packages are shipped to and from. Normally, we ship around 4,400 packages per month. In this airport alone, over 52,000 packages were shipped in and out over the past year. We ship to and from 170 different countries. Not bad, eh? Probably it will go up to over 72,000 packages this year. And despite over 100 flights in and out of here daily, the number of lost or delayed packages is impressively low. If you send your package through here, rest assured, we'll get it where it's going. Let's move on to the area most of us are familiar with, the passenger terminals. In order to be allowed into this area, you must pass through security with your ticket and, if you're travelling internationally, your passport. If you're travelling domestically, you just need a legal form of ID. If you don't have those, you will not be allowed to pass through security and board your flight. 
During the security scan, your carry-on items will be checked for dangerous items such as weapons, sharp objects, and liquids that exceed our specified limit. If you attempt to pass any of the prohibited items on this list posted at the entrance, you are still allowed to board the plane, but you'll be given a warning, and your item will be confiscated. Don't worry, we will not arrest you for having too much shampoo in your bag or anything like that. We also search your carry-ons and parcels for any perishable items. We prohibit the transportation of local vegetation and prohibit parcels containing any insects in them. You may or may not have learnt about this in biology class, but when some plants are introduced to a new environment, they spread wildly and wipe out the current species around it. It is important to control the introduction of new plants into an ecosystem, so we must prohibit the transport of any fertile seeds. So, what happens to parcels containing possibly suspicious items? It's of course something we do not take lightly here. If an object passes through the scanner that appears suspicious in any way, it is separated out for manual search by a member of our trained security personnel. If an illegal plant or simple sharp object like a pocket knife is found, it is simply disposed of in our biohazard waste containers, and the package itself is returned to the sender or passenger if it is for a passenger flight. More serious weapons are reported to higher authorities for investigation. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. As far as parcel security, the material of the parcel is important. For shipped goods, the most common material used and the most widely accepted is paper. Make sure it is packed sturdy enough with no rips or tears. We've definitely had packages rip open before due to haphazard packing. A more common problem, though, is the package labels. When an item does not make it to the right place, this is the most common reason. The label may not be in the right place or marked clearly enough. If you're receiving any items from abroad that must be declared, please remember our guidelines in order to ensure the timely delivery of your item. Make sure it is packed correctly, and we ask that you notify customs between two and ten days within the item's scheduled arrival date. Okay, before we move on, are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student called Tina asking Professor Van Diesen for advice on choosing courses. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, are you Professor Van Diesen? Yes, I am. And who might you be? Oh, sorry, my name is Tina. I'm a freshman here. They told me I should ask you for advice in choosing courses. Well, that's part of what I'm here for. Please come in and sit down. Now, what are your questions? I... I almost don't know. Everything is so confusing. 
Like, what is a specialized course? Oh, easy. A specialized course is one that is compulsory, meaning it's a requirement for your major and regular, so you can't place out by taking a proficiency exam. That sounds pretty strict. Then what are all these general courses? I seem to have to take so many. Nothing to be alarmed over. These are courses open to all students and not directly related to your major. The university offers these general courses to choose so that you can become more well-rounded individuals. For example, I see you're a microbiology major, so it might be a good idea to take some literature or history courses so that you can know something besides all science. You mean these courses are like for fun? That might be one way to look at it, but don't tell the literature professor such a thing. Think of a general course as the opposite of a specified course. A specified course is one that pertains directly to your major. So, can I take any microbiology course I want? Let's see. Oh, those courses used to be open to microbiology students only. The good thing is now it's open to students on a flexible schedule, so it's not only for full-time students. So the answer is yes, if you have the instructor's permission. May I ask you why you chose microbiology? Well, I also like plain old biology too. You know, full-size animals. I might even become a veterinarian. Could I take some biology classes? Well, they are open to full-time students only, which I believe is what you are. I don't know how a freshman would get along with microbiology, though. I mean, most of the students presently looking into it are from off-campus. Off-campus? Yes, you know, people who use it in their work at hospitals, laboratories, even a police detective. Why did you choose microbiology, if I may ask? I don't think you quite answered that. Well, eventually I want to be a doctor. At least my dad tells me so. If I may say so, young lady, you seem a little uncertain. Still, I think that might be a good idea for a career. Of course, if you're thinking about being either a doctor or a vet, you should take some medical science classes before you even think of applying to med school. Great! What should I take? There is one small problem. The new medical sciences building is under construction, so there are no experimental facilities available until next year. I'm afraid you'll have to wait, but don't forget to take those courses at the first opportunity. Oh, bummer. Is there any other course you'd recommend for someone like me? Well, since you seem to like animals, have you ever thought about looking into environmental science? No, I never really thought about it before. Is it worthwhile? Quite. In fact, it's the fastest growing subject on this campus. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm sorry, I couldn't help noticing the long list of classes you've written out there. May I have a look? Oh, sure. Medical science, statistics, laboratory techniques, medicine, mathematics, computing. My, my, a bit of everything here. Is it too much? For your first semester, yes. What I suggest is starting out by taking the compulsory courses. Like we said before, the medical science can wait. Consider taking that in your sophomore year. I think I'd put off computing, too. I recommend to all freshmen that I talk to to get the compulsory mathematics out of the way as early as possible. So take that one. It'll be one less difficult course you have to focus on when the science lab opens next year, and you have to catch up on classes like laboratory techniques. Your major also requires statistics, so you have to balance two math classes, and no doubt you should take that. Otherwise, get your required medicine course out of the way by taking something theory-based. Oh, of course, and your environmental science class, if you're interested. The others can wait. 
though I think computing is definitely a good idea, even though it's not required. I see, too, on your paper there, you seem to have had high marks on the entrance exam. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Don't be shy. Have you thought about applying for a scholarship? Do they have any? I mean, my dad is always complaining about how much money it costs him. In your department, there are actually three full scholarships available. They cover tuition and provide $1,500 cash. $1,500 cash? Party! Please, miss, the money is intended more as a textbook allowance, not party money. If you promise to behave, I'll show you how to apply. Great, and thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about Crocodilus niloticus and its living habits. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we will continue our study of Crocodilus niloticus by talking about its living habits. We've already discussed the evolutionary attributes that set it apart from its crocodile relatives. Does everyone remember that? Yes, it has an extremely narrow snout and three or four rows of protective scales on its back as compared to two rows on other members of the Crocodilus genus. Let's take a look at how these carnivorous man-eaters live, where they live, and finally, whether they really deserve their vicious reputation. To start, I'd like to address a great question posed to me by a student during yesterday's office hours. We talked about the distribution of crocodiles in Africa and saw that they are highly concentrated in the south and west of the continent. This student noticed that on the map displaying the distribution of crocodiles across Africa, there were no crocodiles in the northern region and found no mention in the literature of the existence of crocodiles in the north of Africa. Why might there be no crocodiles in North Africa? Let's save this question for later in the lecture. To find out more about the social habits of the African crocodile, one researcher named Tara Shine of the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland conducted a survey of the wetlands in Mauritania and received reports of 46 crocodiles living in one group, or float as we say when referring to crocodiles, though the usual number is a little less than half of that. In general, crocodiles are more highly concentrated in wet subtropical environments near bodies of water and rich vegetation. While South American crocodiles thrive in cool rainforests, the African crocodile is more equipped for heat. Though they can survive at the hot temperatures found in some deserts, they are not equipped to handle dry climates and thus cannot survive in places like the Sahara Desert of North Africa. As cold-blooded animals, crocodiles' core temperatures fluctuate from their average of 38 degrees Celsius as external conditions change. Thus, they need to avoid extreme temperatures. Others live an underwater life, 
keeping a body temperature close to that of the water. As their own unique method of regulating their body temperatures, some African crocodiles have made dens by digging holes in the ground to provide themselves with a cool, dark place to retreat from the hot African sun. Speaking of the hot African sun, let's go back to the question asked at the beginning of the lecture. We know that there used to be crocodiles in northern Africa, yet today there are none. What are some possible explanations for this? Some students have suggested that the African crocodile has evolved from a desert creature into a wetland creature, thus causing them to migrate south for more appropriate conditions. Others presume that the crocodile was hunted out of northern Africa by a fiercer predator. While these are intelligent guesses, the real story is a little bit different. The key to this migration is that the Sahara Desert did not always cover the north of Africa. About 8,000 years ago, the land was fertile wetlands, perfect for breeding crocodiles. Over time, though, the area dried out and the wetland slowly turned to desert, leading the African crocodile to migrate south to the marshlands they call home today. Some crocodiles did, however, adapt to living in dry conditions. In Mauritania, some crocodiles have learned to survive in an area where they can go up to eight months with no water by spending the driest of times in what's called a torpor, or short period of hibernation. To utilize every bit of rainfall, these desert crocodiles dig underground caves that collect runoff, thus staying cool and hydrated. During the mating period in November and December, males attract females to their viciously protected territory through a number of behaviours that range from snapping their jaws all the way to sending infrasonic pulses through the water. Afterwards, the female digs a hole up to 60 centimetres in depth to store the eggs for an 80-day incubation period. The female protects these eggs during the period and sometimes even helps crack the eggs with her snout at the end. These teeth-gnashing carnivores are softer than we think. Although these vicious creatures have attacked humans on a few occasions, the residents are not afraid of them. In fact, they show a great deal of reverence towards these wondrous creatures. Some say that crocodiles bring water to their habitat, so if they leave, they will bring the water with them. Obviously this is not true, but it demonstrates the admiration the inhabiting people have for crocodiles. Generally, crocodiles do not predate on humans. They attack when humans populate the crocodile's habitat, instilling fear and uneasiness in the crocs. Like any other species, crocodiles are known to attack when feeling fear. There's still a lot more to be discovered about the African crocodile. Researchers want to know more about the population size, how many crocodiles inhabit Africa in all, how they form separate floats, etc. There is still also much to learn about migration patterns and relations to other populations of crocodiles now found in other parts of the world. Next time, we'll examine a few specific case studies of crocodile populations in southern Africa. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.